Okay. Uh, students, what we're going to do today, we're going to review the brain burner from homework 13. And uh, then we're going to push past it and talk a little bit about potential energy. And then we're going to use clickers to do some repeat calculations, a little bit of extra practice on that brain burner type question. And then, you know, a few more questions about it. And then after that, we're going to do some demonstrations. Now, we have some demonstration equipment up here, and we have some over here on the front, on the other side. Uh, and we're going to do some document camera work, and I've already recorded one uh, talking PDF for the morning class, and we're going to do it again uh, with you guys in, in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I have... Uh, I want to go over some news uh, items that affects every single person in this room. I can't be more serious about this. We must defeat TCU. And all, so all I can say is let's go Knights. Hey, who went to the game last night? Oh, man. It must have been. It looked like it was fun. It looked packed. Seriously, standing room only? Man, I tell you. Dedrick, we got your printout. Get it after class. After class. Yeah. See what I was saying? See what I was saying? The two ROTC guys. Okay, so that's the, that's the news from local... A little bit further away, there's was some scientific news uh, from Euro European Space Agency (ESA). That's like the NASA for the, a bunch of countries over in Europe, like France and Italy and stuff like that. England. They have a spacecraft called Rosetta, and it's orbiting uh, not a planet, not Earth, not the Moon, but a comet. Um, comet is called 67P. And it's been observing it. And actually, they crash-landed it on the comet recently. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the data that they uh, have analyzed uh, and just published recently. It's kind of cool. It came up in the news uh, last night. Here's a picture of the comet nucleus. And, and this is a series from uh, July 25th, 2015. So mm, about uh, almost two years ago year and nine months ago. So, um, yeah, this is what the nucleus of a, this is what a comet looks like when it's not so close to the sun that it starts blazing, you know, and, and bubbling and blowing off gas and, and luminous streams of matter. Actually, these ones are blowing off a little bit. You can see they're, they're outgassing. Those kind of wispy tendrils, uh, that's what we call outgassing. And look at the shape of it. It looks, you know, it looks like it actually looks like two things that kind of blob together, you know. And here's another picture of it. This is from almost a year ago. Comet 67P. Here's a close up, and you can see. I, I don't know. It almost looks like a little bit like a like an apple core, you know. Uh, or a barbell or something, you know, but what, you know what it's, I, it looks like to me is uh, two smaller comets kind of knocked together and kind of blazed into each other. But there's something interesting that's happening with this, and I want to show it to you. It was published just a few days ago. You'll see it probably in the news. Um, and it's some close-ups of this cliff. Now look at this. It's a little bit out of focus, okay? You can see a cliff and, you know, you could walk up to the edge of that cliff. It's, it's big enough. Um, and you can see a shadow there, you know, from the sun, cast by the sun, or cast by the, another part of the cliff. Now here's, this is the before image, all right? Now I want you to visually memorize that, all right? So Anthony, take a look at that image. This is the before image. Right? Here's the after image. And I want you to look carefully. Right? Now you have very 
powerful visual recognition in your brains. Let's look at the before picture. After. I see people. What do you see? Before. After. Before. Yeah. See this? Right here. Good eyes. This part broke off right there. They can't, that's a piece of a comet. It's millions of miles away. The Rosetta spacecraft measured it and recorded. This is a picture, black and white. That's good. And this, see how it's a little bit lighter in color? You know what that is? It's ice. It's ice freshly exposed by a landslide. Now, when we're looking at Mars, we're trying to find similar landslides and things. And you know why we want to find that? Because the, it, frequently, on Mars anyways, it shows the presence of water. Right? So, um, so if you want to read more about it, just uh, Google search ESA and Rosetta and 67P, and you'll get a ton of stuff to read and zillions of pictures. And uh, yeah, it's kind of cool looking. And so, you know, it, and it's, it's interesting to think because that comet eventually is going to fall apart. All right. It's going to get so unstable. You know, right now, this before picture, things were looking fairly solid. Things were holding together pretty good. But this cliff, you know, eventually gave way and we caught it. We caught the fracture uh, and the aftermath of it, those, the, the fresh light colored area that we think is, is ice. Uh, and so eventually this comet's going to, you know, get completely discombobulated. And really what it shows is that comets do not last forever. A lot of times a comet, as it swings by the, the sun, it might go past a different planet or a moon just close enough to budget one or two degrees or even half a degree. And by the time it gets back to the sun, it'll plunge right into the sun and be done. It'll disappear. And we've seen comets do that. You know, they go around the backside of the sun and they don't come back out. And that means they crashed on the other side of the sun. Uh, Jupiter does the same thing. If you go by um, like Saturn a little too close, you get budged a little bit out of your normal orbit, you know, you might get um, absorbed by Jupiter or vice versa. You know, Jupiter might budge the comet a little bit. And so the next time around, you know, a thousand years later, it might uh, zap into the surface of uh, Saturn. And, we, and Saturn and Jupiter uh, eat a lot, or sweep, we, what we, the word we use in astronomy is sweep. They sweep a lot of comets. And of course, the sun sweeps tons of them. And has done so over the eons of time since the solar system formed. Anyways, kind of interesting to read about. Uh, it was all over the English newspapers yesterday, so I thought I'd just share you. Uh, with that, and as a side note, uh, if you still have another GEP science to take and you want to take astronomy 2002, that's taught by the physics department. I sometimes get that class, but usually they have a bunch of other guys teaching it. Uh, I, they only parachute me in at the last minute uh, if there's an emergency, but uh, they have a lot of really smart planetary physics astronomers in our department that teach it. And they know all about comets, asteroids, uh, near-Earth asteroids, the planets, Pluto, everything. And we got one international expert on set, like the world's expert on Saturn on our faculty, Dr. Cola. So, all right. Let's double check the brain burner from homework 13. I had a couple students uh, message me in discussions about it. Let's double check it. Take notes. And you're going to do a calculation in a few minutes uh, and just to see how you do on this calculation. Okay, so get your calculator out and your clicker. And the clickers are working today, so let's get, get down to it. Question? Okay, two things. One, I broke my glasses, so I'll try to keep them in this, but I'm not taking pictures of And then two, I'm 
Do you want to sit up here? Do you want to sit up here? What's that? Because the meters are in the denominator, so it's actually multiplies by ten. Yeah. Let's let's check this one out too, because this is a good one. It's similar. All right, here we go. So the the homework problem. I had a, a, a student message me. I'm not going to look at anybody. I actually, she is in here. Message me, Doctor P. I thought we were supposed to have eight questions, and I only see seven. But what she was looking at was the points. There were eight points because this problem had two points. Seven questions, six one-pointers, and one two-pointer. Anyways, so the, the, the setup was the following. You, you get a hunk of jade attached to a spring. Now, for everybody, the dip was 10 centimeters down. Delta Y, negative 0 0.10 meters. All right, that's for everybody. That was actually part of the diagram. And then everybody, you know, every time you did it, you got a slightly different number of kilograms of mass. All right. And so the question was, can you use that information to figure out K, the, the uh, spring constant? And the answer is yes. And the key to that is to realize that the spring stabilizes the jade in midair. It doesn't fall. It's weight. If there, if there was no spring, it would just free fall down. But you've got the spring pulling it upward. So it, as long as you know that the object is stabilized, that tells you that the net force is zero. The forces will balance. All right? So if there's any forces on it, but it's not accelerating or you know it's just kind of sitting there, nice and stable, then yeah, you've got forces that balance. Left and right, if any. Vertically, up and down, if any. And let's take a look. Uh, we do have two constituent forces acting on this chunk of jade. Right? So uh, we have some weight force downward, and we have this spring force pulling upward. Now, I'm going to put in a dot here to represent the center of the jade. Now let me move that chunk of jade out of the picture. So here's my dot. And let's put an arrow downward for the weight force, good old mg, downward. So a certain number of newtons, depending on how many kilograms of mass. Okay. And we're going to use 2.1 kilograms here for an example, just a second. But anyways, we got that one. And then the other constituent force is the spring force, and that's pulling upward. The spring is pulled downward by the rock, by the chunk of jade. So the spring exerts an upward force. Delta Y is negative. Force is positive, upward. All right? Now, because they're stabilized, or because the jade is stabilized, you know, you kind of ease it down. And so, so you don't want it to go, you know, boing, 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 you know, up and down, you know. I mean, eventually that'll quiet down to zero, but you know, just ease it down till you know, just kind of till it's at its equi new equilibrium point, and you know that the forces balance. All right, so the net force has got to be zero. So if you have ten newtons downward from weight force, you got ten newtons upward for uh, spring force, and that's the key because that will get us the value of the spring force. Camille. Yeah, K is newtons per meter, and, and actually this problem, it's stated in terms of meters. Oh, but verbally, I'm talking about centimeters and meters as well. So, um, But yeah, when we do the calculation, we're going to be in meters. Okay? Yeah. All right. So let's work this example out. And th you may have had this very value for the mass, 2.1 kilograms. All right? That's a good, nice piece of jade, you know, maybe the size of a, a baseball or so, all right? So, and we know how to calculate the, the weight force, 
If you know the mass, ding. 2.1 kilograms times negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And that works out to negative 20.58 newtons. Double check me. Make sure I'm not trying to. Okay. Anybody verify me? Good. I see one. Okay. Good. What's your name in the back again? EJ? DJ? Okay. You're always checking me back there. I can always, you know. It's good, because you know, usually the guys in the back row, they're back there screwing around on Facebook and stuff, but I'm glad you're a straight arrow back there. Good, DJ. So negative 20.58 downward. All right, spring force has got to be upward 20.58. Ding, because they balance. All right. Now, if you have a spring that's not strong enough, you might not be able to support that much of a, that big of a rock. The spring will break. All right. It'll, it'll extend so much. It'll try to extend and extend and extend and eventually bang, it'll break, which can happen. You know, and you know, like in my garage, you know, I got the springs up in the garage door. They actually broke. Those things are ginormous. They're very big springs, but they can break. Anyways, these, this spring doesn't break. So we have 20.58 newtons upward. All right, now we're ready to go to the formula. And instead of F equals minus KX, this one's vertical. So we use F equals minus K times my vertical displacement, delta Y. And that's going to be a negative 0 0.10 meters. All right. So on the left of the second line here, I have 20.58 newtons that I got from my key. And then I have a minus K on the right side and in parentheses a minus negative, or I have a minus 0 0.10 meters. And hey, you guys, those minus signs kind of cancel. You know, negative of a negative is a positive. So really, you can just write K times 0 0.10 meters if you want. And here's the quotient that you have to calculate. 20.58 newtons divided by 0 0.10 meters. So now, Camille, when you're doing this, division by a tenth is the same as multiplication, Kamari, by 10. So divide by 1 tenth, 0 0.1, it's the same as multiply by 10. So your answer here is just 205.8 newtons per meter. So that was an easy one. But you're going to have a clicker question here where you're not going to have a denominator of 0 0.10. So, but it, you calculate the same way. Mr. Ghosh. The question was, is the F always going to be positive? And oh, it just depends on the situation. If you have um, a, horizontal, a horizontal spring, and you push positive x, the pullback force is negative. So you just got to look at the layout. So I always go with the diagram first, and then I figure, okay, my, my spring force is going to be left, so negative, or my spring force is going to be up, so positive. And so that's, that's what I do. And you have to, as I've mentioned before, you know, like Camille was talking on the thread, Dr. B, is it always going to be a minus k? And I said, no, not if you take care of the uh, negative signs and the upward and down um, sign of the forces and the displacements. So there's your answer on that. K is equal to 205.8 newtons per meter. Now, I'd like to point something out to you about that, and this is going to bring us to the concept of potential energy. We're going to do a little calculation of potential energy. If you multiply... K by some number of meters squared, you know, like 17 square meters, uh, then you're going to get Newton meters. Because you know, K is Newtons per meter. I mean, you just multiply by like 17 square meters, you know, you're going to get some cancellation. You're going to be left with Newton meters. And hey, you guys, that's a joule. It's an energy unit. So we're going to use that now to calculate potential energy. 
spring potential energy. And make a note uh, in your, in your uh, notebook or your computer, the formula for spring potential energy, one half kx squared. Right? We're going to use that. Right? So let's say that we have a spring, as I have in the diagram here, and good, nice, easy, round number, 2,000 newtons per meter for the spring constant. All right. And let's say that we stretch it out and hold it at 0.22 meters. All right. You know, just a nice round number. Elizabeth? <coughs> What's that? EQ is equilibrium. Okay, so that's x equals zero. All right. And the weight, that gray rectangular weight attached to the spring is could be 22 centimeters to the right of equilibrium or 0 0.22 meters. Right. And so what we're going to do here in the next minute or two is figure out the spring potential energy state of this system. When you pull it out to the position 0 0.22 meters to the right, all right, so when it's at that position, you can figure out the potential energy, all right? So let me clean up my page a little bit. I'll move this out, move that up, all right? So there's all our information and our diagram. It's all in there. Here's the calculation that you have to make. Uh, 1 half kx squared. So let's take a look at this calculation block. In the second line on the right side of the equal, I have 1 half, 0 0.5, and then I have my spring constant, which I just chose, you know, 2,000 to have a round number. 2,000 newtons per meter. Okay, so that's good. And then I have 0 0.22 meters quantity squared. Now put that square symbol outside the parentheses. Okay, we got two per, three parentheses on that second line. Now, on the third line, I combine 0 0.5 and 2,000 into the first parentheses, which is 1,000 newtons per meter. Okay, so that's kind of an intermediate step. You might not feel like doing that, but I've written it out so that, you know, because some people, they like to go step by step. That's good. We'll do it. Right? And then I also squared up 0 0.22. Now verify me on that if you can. 0 0.22 squared is equal to 0 0.0484. Good. And notice I also have it inside the parentheses meter squared now. All right? And that's significant. And it's significant because, um, Bobby, what we're going to do is cancel. So I'm flaming out my meters in the denominator of the first parenthesis on the third line of my calculation block. And then, but Kane, what I'm doing on the second term with meter squared, I'm just crossing out the two. Because I only can cancel one power. So I, I now have meters to the first power. So I'm not canceling at the M, I'm just canceling out the two. And so what I'm left with is meters to the first power. And we don't usually write down meters to the one power, but you, I mean, you could if you want. You know, cross out the two and write in a one. But if you think about it, then the only thing left you have here is newtons in the numerator and meters in the numerator. numerator. And that's newton meters. The value is 48.4. And so that's the same as 48.4 joules of potential energy at this position for this spring with spring constant 2,000 newtons per meter. Okay. Repeat. Yep. I traditionally use the equilibrium point and because you can you can slide your x-axis wherever you feel like it's convenient so it's, on an oscillator system, it's usually convenient to make your oscillator axis, your oscillator dimension, be zero at the symmetry point or the equilibrium point. This, look at it. 
you're to the right of equilibrium. So you've pulled it to the right. Okay. All right. And it's pulling back. Um, Mr. Ghosh, what was your first name again? Josh. Joshua Ghosh. This here's a case where the force, the spring force F is a negative number. Now we're not going to calculate it, but I mean you could, it's easy, you know. 2,000 times 0 0.22, and it's negative. And then that would give you the, the number of newtons, so whatever that is. So you just got to look at the diagram and then decide, you know, is it left, is it negative, you know, stuff like that. Repeat. Yeah, when I describe the, the starting state of the spring, uh, that's... You know, I'll, I'll describe what, you know, how you get to that initial state. Right, so it's usually easy. I usually go with um, pulling, pulling it out to the right. Matter of fact, let's do some clicker questions now. And let's practice these calculations. Now, the first question is a calculation question. Spring. And here the vertical dip is... Negative 0 0.15 meters. So it's not negative 0 0.10 like the homework. And you've got a different mass, but it works the same way. So go ahead and calculate that, and I'll give you a couple minutes. Can you turn the lights all the way on? Do I what? Ever teach like general physics 102? Like 2053, 2054? Um, yeah, last, no, two summers ago, summer of 2014, I taught 2053 in summer A. Mm -hmm. Six weeks. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It was rough. I really. Man, they worked, I, I, I worked those guys, and they worked like, you know, subhuman maniacs. I mean, it was, I was a subhuman maniac, and they were, you know, doing pretty good, too. And, but, the, you know, they did really, really good. And I've given a bunch of them recommendations for jobs and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they come, Dr. B, can you recommend me for this, you know, a scholarship or a job or something like that? So, boy, so, yeah, I do, it's... If you take it from me, <laughs> if you take it from me, you'll be fine. But any other student, boy, oh boy, they'll work. But it was good because they they did really good. You know, you know, plenty of groaning and complaining and stuff. That's normal, I guess. But boy, they you know when it, when the chips were down for exams and stuff, they just they just like these guys. These guys work hard too. That's what I like about UCF. Right, Mivosh? Yeah, that's what I like about this place. Got guys like DJ in the back, you know, working hard, keeping an eye on things, checking me out, double checking. Do not let me catch you napping, DJ. Yeah, so the answer is, but I... This summer I'm going to be teaching uh, 1121 online, but do you have to take it yeah. <laughs> in the summer? Or I just have to take it before I graduate. So, <laughs> yeah. but who knows when that's going to be? You know, that would be, I'll tell you, yeah, I know you can't finish UCF. <laughs> that would be a tough semester for me if I was teaching this one big section of this and another big section of that. But I can ask around who are the good. Well, you can ask around who are the good instructors. You, have you have you heard anything? You haven't heard about Doctor B, <laughs> the notorious Doctor B. Most of the things I hear about you, I hear about in this class. So. <laughs> All right, how are we doing here? Uh, forty-five seconds.
about the same as last class, actually. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Bing. Uh, you guys are pretty good. Answer is 65.3. Here's the calculation of most of you got it. Uh, a few of you didn't. About 30 of you did not get it right. But... Um, you put in the displacement, negative 0 0.15 meters. Uh oh You see where I made a mistake with my formula? F equals minus kx. It should be F equals minus k delta y. It's all right because it's, just, it's the same philosophy, but you could write that down as minus k times delta y. Did you have a question, Lexi? The spring is, the displacement of the spring is downward. So that means the pull of the spring is the other direction, upward. All right, so the left side here is going to be a positive number of newtons, 9.8 in this case. All right. The minus sign from the minus k is always there by definition. Now your displacement in the parentheses it could be positive or negative. It just depends on, and in this case, it's negative. You have a dip. You know, you attach the, the rock or the, or the weight, and it drops a little. In this case, by 15 centimeters downward, negative 0 0.15 meters. Okay, and then you just let the, you know, here, you, you can cancel them right there if you want. You know, and then you have positives everywhere. And, and then that's your calculation. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, he's 9.8. In this class, yeah, he's 9.8. I saw somebody, did I, did I mention it on discussions with you? Or somebody I did. That was using 9.81 and I mentioned it on discussions. Anyway. He's 9.8. Second question. Potential energy. All right. Now we're using the same spring, but we're horizontal. So now we're doing a delta x. Okay. I'm, I'm moving out to 0 0.40 meters. Calculate the spring potential energy at this position. Can you start this question, please? And then turn on the lights. <coughs> Now, this is using 65.3 newtons per meter for the spring constant. And position X is 0 0.40 meters. You know what was interesting? The last class, how the, the students did really good on the first two questions, but then on the last question, you know, we got that different reaction. Was that Christine? Chris. Chris. I have, That's Chris. I have Chris then, and then I have Chris. This is just Chris. I can't keep track of all your friends. No, I'm so popular. I know. <laughs>
Hmm? No, we could have do we could have done SPE for the uh, for the hanging piece of J. Any oscillator. Uh -huh. Yep. Camille, what happened to your specs? Are they expensive? See these ones I use? These ones? Like $4 at Walmart. That's all I need. Yeah. All right, uh, 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Good. Uh, most of you did well in that. Lights, please. Uh, the answer is uh, here. Your calculation: zero point five times the spring constant, and my intermediate. Value 0 0.5 times 65.3, uh, 32.65 newtons per meter. And then 0 0.40 meters quantity squared down here on the third line of the calculation block, 0 0.16 square meters. And then just calculate them together. Question? Did you ask us to round it to 5.2? Yeah, and so that's the answer. All right, so 5.224 is all your digits and then I ask you to round it off to five point to nearest tenth so 5.2 now go ahead and write down this answer SPE is 5.2 joules at X equals 0 0.40 if I give you any other position you could figure out the potential energy fine potential energy remember is the energy of position so if you know the position, you can figure out the potential energy. And that's what we've got in this case. It's different from gravitational, but that's all right. You know, it's a different kind of a physical system. Now, next clicker question, hit the refresh key, because this one's going to be multiple choice. And a question from the left side of the room. Squared it. So then why, why is the squared still? You square the 0.4 and you get 0.16. You square the meters and you get square meters. Okay. You gotta square both. Okay. All right, question number three. If the spring mass system has 5.2 joules of SPE at 0 0.40 meters position. How much does it have at 0, 0.0? I see people using their calculators, but actually... Yeah, not really. Twenty seconds. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Ching. Most of you got that one. But 
prepare to burn your brain. Question four. How much kinetic energy does it have at 0, 0.0? Da, 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 da. Very good. Good. David, you look real, real relaxed. Is this easy for you? You're thinking? All right. Yep. See? Similar. <laughs> similar array. Thirty seconds. Decide. Not. Springs K E. Yeah, one half K X squared. What's that? Yeah. Oh, for kinetic energy? Yeah, one half mv squared. What else do you know about kinetic energy? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's display the results. My wonderful students, look at this. There's a, there's a little bit of explaining necessary. Some people voted for A, some for B, some for C. Go to the uh, laptop, please. Thank you. Correct answer is C. Now, here's the reasoning. And up here in the front world, they were saying, Dr. B, what is this about energy and stuff? And they eventually figured out, yeah, conservation of energy. So make a note. The conservation of energy means that if you lose some kinetic, you gain, or excuse me, if you lose some potential from 0 0.40 all the way into equilibrium, 0 0.00, then you gain kinetic. If you lose kinetic on the way back out to the left or to the right, you gain potential energy all right so if you if you had and and notice that the way that i set this up you pull it out to 0 0.40 meters and when you're out there at 0 0.40 meters you're holding it zero kinetic energy so minimum kinetic max potential at 0 0.40 meters but back at equilibrium the previous question, zero potential energy. Therefore, max kinetic. So make a note. In the physical system of an oscillator, the symmetry point or the equilibrium point is going to be max kinetic energy. So max kinetic energy, maximum speed. Right? The, the, ex, the furthest extensions, the furthest compressions, the maximum displacements, left or right, are going to be minimum kinetic energy, maximum potential energy. Those are the, called the turning points of the motion. Now, in free fall, for a baseball, 
you know, in free fall flight, you know, a ballistic arc, there's a turning point of the motion. We call it apogee. It stops going up and it starts going down. Same thing with the oscillator. It stops going right and it starts going left. Then it stops going left and goes back to the right and zips back and forth. Now, we're going to do some demonstrations now with a pendulum and then with some sound waves. And uh, we're going to actually make uh, a study of oscillation. Question. Yeah, and really what you have to do is specify it's time for me to sneeze again. I always sneeze at this point. I can feel it coming. Um, you always have, can you specify the initial condition? So that means initial position and initial velocity. And usually what with you guys, I'm going to specify, you know, max extension and zero velocity. Meaning, you pull it out and you hold it, and then you let it go. And when you let it go, you start the timer. And then you study, you know, what happens after that. Yeah. But you could, you know, if you think about it, you could, you could um, pull it out to, you know, some max extension, and then give it a shove when you let it go. And then it would have, a, like, a negative velocity to initial velocity. But, and that would change your energy and your, you know, total mechanical energy, your kinetic, and your potential. So it just depends on what you do. But for you guys, it's going to be fairly simple. Mm-hmm. Question. Correct. Okay. Furthest displacement, either left or right, is minimum kinetic. And for us, it's going to be z usually zero kinetic energy. Rest. A turning point in the motion. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask for four volunteer timers up front. Um, can you turn the lights on? And I'm going to stop the podcast here. We're going to do some document camera and talking PDFs in just a few minutes. But before we do that, we're going to do some demonstrations. And let me get my cursor here. All right.